I'm a bartender, so I am judge and jury. If I don't like you, you're gone. And they're like, I will, I will, I will yelp about this. I'm like, go ahead. Don't care. They're like, you just lost a customer. I'm like, yeah, a shitty one. <laughs> Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Science, the show that breaks down the science of television and movies with a comedian and a scientist. Today, we're discussing Squid Game, so I'll ask about gunshot wounds, falling to your death, and getting your hands squished in a spinning factory wheel machine thingy. Hi everyone, I'm your host Ethan Edberg, and I've got two amazing guests with me today. It's unbelievable. My first guest made his mark on one of my favorite shows of all time, Jeopardy. This genius won 12 games in a row and ranks 8th in consecutive wins and highest winnings earned. He has hosted trivia nights for more than 15 years across the U.S. and has a book out called The Ultimate Book of Pub Trivia by the Smartest Guy in the Room. Over 300 rounds and more than 3,000 questions. Welcome to the show, Austin Rogers. Thank you very much, Ethan. I'm very excited, and thank you for the uh, glowing introduction. And no hyperbole. <laughs> I'm I'm thrilled to have you, man. I got to say, I'm super excited to, to actually talk to you in real life. Um, I did read, I think on Wikipedia or, or something, that you don't own a television. Now, is that true? And does that mean that you don't watch movies and TV? Because we are discussing Squid Game. So at the time, whenever that was written, while I was studying for Jeopardy and before I was on Jeopardy, I did not own a television and I just watched things on basically YouTube and stuff like that. Mm. But uh, over time, I've joined... Uh, the proletariat, and I am uh, I am fully in television right now, but uh, but just like you know the cord cutting style. But so yes, I have seen Squid Games. Is it Squid Games or Squid Game? It's Squid Game, isn't you it? You know, it's Squid Game, but but everyone yeah. calls it Squid Games. Like, yo, I'm gonna watch the Squid Games. I <laughs> yeah, like the Olympic Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the Squid Games, the baseball games, the football games, and the Squid Games. <laughs> yeah, of course. I think that's how you can tell that somebody isn't a huge sports fan, that they're like, oh, I'm going to watch basketball games tonight. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, that sounds really odd. Um, but let me let me introduce our second guest because I'm equally thrilled to have him on the program. He is a double board certified expert plastic and reconstructive surgeon who is also the author of The Real Beauty Bible, Navigating Your Journey Through Plastic Surgery. Welcome to the show, Dr. Richard J. Brown. Thank you, sir. I go by Ricky, which is totally fine. Appreciate you. I don't have the Jeopardy record. Sorry. I would fail. I would crash and burn miserably on that show. Oh, yeah. No, same here. I'm glad that uh, that we're on the same page on that. We are equals in that regard. And I'm glad you go by Ricky because it's definitely hard to avoid some sort of Doc Brown comment. And, I, and I'm sure that you get that all the time. And I apologize for bringing it up. I'm about as easy going as it gets. I and I when people say doctor, I always look over my shoulder. I'm like, you're talking to me. <laughs> oh, that is me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yes, great. That's me. And and from what I understand, you did a lot of heavy trauma procedures in Chicago that got you interested in plastic surgery. Uh, do I have that right? And and can you tell me about that? Yeah. So I'm general surgery trained. There's a couple of tracks you can do to get the plastics, but. Um, the old school way was to do the full five-year general surgery training program and then do a plastic surgery fellowship. So I was in Chicago at a level one trauma center right down the street from Cook County Hospital. We all know the famous show ER. And uh, yeah, it was Knife and Gun Club. So seen it, done it, all of it. It's crazy. It's been a long time. But yeah, I did all that stuff before I went into plastics and did my plastics fellowship. You said that so nonchalantly. Is that like the slang name for that hospital, the Knife and Gun Club? What was that? <laughs> It is a slang. It is a slang term. Like we, we literally like we used to sit outside of the ER at nighttime and hear the gunshots at Rogers Park behind the hospital and just look down at our trauma pagers and wait for them to go off. It was insane. Wow. Okay, yeah. Austin, have you been stabbed and shot? I unfortunately have not. Uh, maybe by paintball guns several times, <laughs> and and I I still am a practicing bartender, so I've definitely stabbed oh. myself a couple times, but more <laughs> on more in the digital region than anything else. And that's just throw a band aid on it and squeeze some lemon juice in it because the lemon juice is going to get in there anyway. 
And you do mean digital by your digits, not that you are virtual bartending, because I do know you do virtual <laughs> trivia nights. I do virtual trivia, which is digital, but I right. meant my actual physical digits. Yes, I've cut my fingers many, many a times, uh, and I've got these scars, nicks, and uh, little love taps to prove it. Nice. Great. <laughs> See? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> if you're not watching on YouTube, uh, Ricky is missing a finger. It's tragic. <laughs> and uh, our, our thoughts go out to that missing finger wherever it is. Yeah. Um, OK, so, yeah, we're talking about Squid Game. Obviously, this is like the most popular show of all time. Everyone has seen Squid Game and loved it. Uh, I think I wanted to get your both of your uh, opinions on it. So, so, Ricky, why don't we start with you? What did you think about Squid Game? You know, I liked it. I like the gore, obviously. Um, the concept is just interesting. Like, I, I just finished it, actually, which is kind of funny because oh. I was halfway through it. And my wife was like, oh, how do you watch that stuff? And we always watch stuff together. So I finally finished it this weekend. And the ending was awesome. But, you know, I mean, these just the idea behind it is unbelievable. And the fact that I think, aren't there, like, people in Korea, if they watch it, they're, like, putting them in jail or murdering them or something I've, I've read about? Like, Whoa. they can't. It's like North, that, like, North Korea. Not, yeah, okay. they're not allowed to watch it in North Korea. It's insane. Yeah. But the concept was pretty interesting. Like, I, I really liked it. I love that stuff. Yeah, I agree. I thought it was fascinating. I was glued, binged it, couldn't help it. Uh, Austin, totally. what about you? What do you think? I thought it was super fun. And actually, like Dr. Brown, like Ricky, I uh, I got about halfway through. And it was one of those ones that you're like, let's do this. This is awesome. Let's do this. This is awesome. And then if you don't actually go back to revisit it, you're just sort of like, I'll get to it. But luckily, uh, this opportunity came about, Ethan. So I went back and I finished it off. And yeah, uh, what an ending. And by the way, capitalism, we're great. We're <laughs> yeah, awesome. Capitalism rules, dude. Capitalism rules. <laughs> it's yes, a lot. <laughs> There's nothing remotely like rich people doing this stuff right now. No, no. never. It's a fantasy, <laughs> Austin. Yeah, but that blew me away because I just got to that. Obviously, watching the show, that's in the last couple of episodes, and I was like, "What? Who are these guys? Crazy!" <laughs> and why were their name tags Musk, Bezos, <laughs> and <laughs> and why the masks? What was like the masks were freaking? I'm like, how are they going to take their shots through those masks? Yeah, and our billionaire villains don't hide behind masks. Come on, <laughs> that's not realistic. Yeah, that would be so helpful, actually, because they would be so obvious that they were evil mastermind billionaires if they just wore masks <laughs> and we never knew what they looked like. It's just super totally. scary. It would make the uprising well easier because we just yeah. anonymize them. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, we don't have to feel bad for them as people anymore. We can just go. It's, like, just the, it's the bejeweled deer. Yeah, I'm, personally, I'm against rid of him. The, the owner of Amazon Skull Mask. I really hate him. <laughs> Down with Ruby Crusted Otter. <laughs> Down with Ruby Crusted Otter. Wow, that's so good. Um, okay, so we're talking about the injuries here today. I wanted to get your your take, Ricky, on basically how people are dying or just getting severely injured in this show and if it was realistic you know what stuck out to you um i i have a list here of just brutal stuff that <laughs> happens in this show um but the first one uh wasn't so bad the first one i noticed it was in the pilot when uh ji hoon i believe it's pronounced i might be mistaken on that is like in the bathroom and he's you know getting a he gets his like nose broken and his nose starts bleeding by these guys that he owes money to. And oh, so yeah. my question there was actually that one of them like licks his blood, like gets some on his finger and then purposefully eats it uh, essentially. And I, and he says it tastes sweet also, which I thought was really weird because anytime I've had to unfortunately taste some blood, it was very metallic. So <laughs> I wanted your take on that. And then I wanted, you know, what the risks of infection are. You know, to, to actually putting somebody else's blood in your mouth. Yeah, I mean, if they have a bloodborne disease, then you could absolutely get it from doing that. It's just transferring bodily fluids to your body. So if they had something like hepatitis, absolutely. The sweet, I don't know, man. Maybe he had a lot of Splenda that day. I, I've never descri <laughs> described blood as, a, as tasting sweet, but maybe that's just a taste bud thing. But I, I'm sure there are things that you could, like, put in your body that manipulate the taste of your own blood. None that I know of, though. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that scene was so funny. Wasn't that like a rite of passage or something? It was like, I don't remember because I watched that, that first one so long ago. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I, I think it was just them, uh, you know, establishing the threat of, of yeah. real life that this is going to get really bad for him if he stays here. Um, yeah. But yeah, I did think that maybe it was also in retrospect alluding to the diabetes that his mother has. And maybe that's what they were trying to say with the blood is sweet. Or maybe this uh, criminal is just a freak. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't know. I, you know, I've never heard of like, I mean, obviously, I don't really get that many people that taste blood. So I don't get to hear the, the different palettes of blood. <laughs> it's not what I normally see. <laughs> but from the medical standpoint, I'm sure that there's some things you could put in your body that make your blood taste different. That's in your uh, Moldovan mountain annex. That's the uh, satellite office. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We get the blood suckers out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you always got to have a good blood sommelier on staff. <laughs> they're all they're all curiously named Vlad, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so strange. So what, eh, coincidence. Yeah, so I, I thought that was really strange. And then I believe in the same episode or early on, we, we get this... Uh, awful boss's hand squished into this factory wheel uh thing oh yeah and you know i get very paranoid about my hands uh overall because if you've ever if you're like me and you've ever had an injury where you can't use your hands it becomes so apparent that you just use your hands for everything and without hands life is just so much more difficult um, so definitely appreciate your hands uh, if you got them out there. But so this guy gets uh, at least one of his hands completely demolished. And I was curious from a surgical standpoint, like, is he hopeless now or is there a chance that you think you could you could get this guy's hand back? Yeah, so it depends. We when I trained in Omaha, Nebraska for plastics, we used to get corn picker injuries all the time, like dudes that would get their hands stuck in the corn pickers out on the farms and stuff. Oh, no. So the answer to that question is how much trauma it causes. So there's there's a cut trauma. So if you like slice a finger off, which remind me, I have a great story about that. If you slice a finger off, you cut through the vessels and you cut through the nerves clean. You have a better chance of reattaching that under the microscope than an avulsion type injury like in that, that press you got. Because that just rips tendons. It rips vessels. There's like literally they're so destroyed end to end that you can't suture them back together. So those crush injuries become injuries of let's just get them functional. Like, you know, if it's just pincer grasp with like a couple of fingers, obviously the thumb is the most important digit to keep. But yeah, dude, it's a crush injury versus a slice or cut injury is really what de determines that. And Ricky, is that just you or is this like, is this the A teams together? Because we got to have nerves, we got to have bones, we got to have musculature, and then we've got to have the, the plastic reconstruction too. I mean, this uh, hand injuries, that's not just you, right? Yeah, so it depends. So sometimes, so hand surgeons can be orthopedic trained or through plastic surgery trained, one of those two. So the orthopedic guys that do hand they do all their pinnings and bone work as well as the nerve work and vascular work. And a lot of plastic surgeons train with orthopedic guys so they can too. But you're absolutely right. Sometimes it's a team approach. Like sometimes if you have a hand guy who's not really good with the fancy flaps, muscle flaps and things to get soft tissue coverage, if that's gone, then you need a plastic surgeon to help do that. So definitely a team approach. Wowzers. Okay. And I was uh, specifically instructed to remind you of a story from some oh, finger getting. So, coming, I think. so when I'm in re my first year of plastic surgery training, um, I get called to the ER. I'm on the hand service and I get called in for a guy who, who uh, cut his thumbs off. And I was like, crap, we're going to be up all night long. sewing these things together. Like this is going to be so painful. So I go in to see the guy and I walk into the room to talk to him just to kind of take a history and figure out what happened. And I was like, so why did you do this? He's like, oh, well, God told me to do it. And I was like, oh, he told you to cut your thumbs off with steak knives. So I'm like, okay. So I take his history and I go back and I call my attending fully expecting like book the OR. We're going up. We're going to sew him back on. We'll take care of him. So I call my attending and, uh, and I tell him the story. He goes, well, that's easy send him home. We don't sew thumbs back onto people who cut him off because he'll cut him off again. And I was like, yes, back to bed, baby. <laughs> <laughs> what oh my the God. hell? But what no, the dude, hell? the guy was so sad, right? Like imagine waking up being like, oh my God, Whoa. I was off my meds. What did I do? Oh I mean, it was crazy. God. I mean, Hippocratic what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I need a follow up. I need somebody get this guy uh, on the Zoom here. I want to talk to him. <laughs> That's wild. So, but wait, no, so honestly, if you think about it from the from the psychological standpoint, if they're off meds or they're in, like you're going to go spend 
18 hours reattaching thumbs and they cut them off again. Like right. it's a waste of resources. Like it's hard to hear that, but it's actually a thing. Damn, that's yeah, brutal. because if they've got that compulsion that deeply ingrained, they'll be like, what's this doing here again? I thought I got rid of you. <laughs> I thought we were gone. <laughs> yeah, it's just an annoyance to him. <laughs> so wait, who specifically made that call? That's a that's a really well, tough call. So it's a tough call. Like it was it was I made it sound as simple as sweet. Just get out of there. It was he asked me questions about the guy's mental health, where he was. We had a psyche eval on the guy. He wasn't in his right mind, all of that. So it wasn't just an erratic decision. There, There's a lot of thought that goes into it. But, you know, just uh, it was to me that was unreal, right? Like as a surgeon in training, I was like, wait, we're not going to do this? And I didn't understand it until he kind of explained it to me. And I was like, OK, well, that makes sense. But also, don't you want the chance? You're like, I got I got a thumb guy here. I got a chance to work on the thumbs. I never did a thumb before. Exactly. Bring him back. You know what? Yeah. Actually, I could use the practice. Let him go back and cut him off again. Bring him back a second time. I'll fund it myself. I got a double thumb guy. <laughs> I just, I, I always wanted to do a thumb. I never did a thumb before. Now I got this guy, so I got a lot of thumbs to do. Also, I'm just trying to think logistically, too, like, Cutting off one thumb, cool. We've all, you know, cut into meat or whatever. <laughs> yeah, like cutting off the second one, that's kind of tough. Yeah, the thumb, you got to have the thumb. The opposable opposable pin, pincer grasp is what it's all about. When you lose the thumb, we try to save those. That's the other thing. So we try to save those at all cost, which really speaks to the fact that this surgeon was like, yeah, we're not we're not doing that, which means that was a pretty a pretty deep decision to make. Well, hey, the bright side of the story is that God got his wish. Yeah, I guess so. I was like, when he said that, I was like, wait, what? I was like, what did you use? He was like a steak knife. I was like, oh, that had yeah, to hurt. A steak knife like you're an idiot. Like that a had steak to knife, hurt, dude. dude. Yeah, you couldn't get like a really sharp ginsu and just karate chop it off. I mean, there's so many nerves, right, in your fingers and in your hand. So it's like that has yeah. to, I mean, even if you do it clean, right, doesn't that hurt like crazy? Yeah, I mean, there's the, there's digital nerves on the on both sides that run up the sides, and then lots of little branches that go off. But yeah, yeah, I can imagine that hurt a little bit. Yikes! You think it hurt more than the guy with the wheel thing, factory Squid Game injury? <sighs> I don't know, man. The crush injury, those are pretty rough. The clean cut, man, you get kind of numb. Yeah. Oh God, you're right. It keeps going until someone shuts the thing off, right? Like literally that, that scene blew me away. And when they, yeah. when that scene happened, I was like, yep, seen that before. Do we shut off? Cause you hear these, you hear these stories about people like in high trauma situations and they're like, I felt nothing. Uh, yeah. Do we, do we have a mechanism where we just like, uh, uh-uh, overload circuit breaker thrown and we're not going to feel this right now. Cause the brain's like, we don't want to feel this. Or do we feel that stuff the whole time through? Yeah, And how can we, and how can we control that? adrenaline it's adrenaline it's all endorphins and adrenaline release in that moment you're so hyped up like if you ever had something that happened you were so hyped up and then after the fact like 10 15 minutes later you're like oh that actually really hurts like it's yeah a car crazy. accident been in a car yeah. accident yeah exactly so i ran home up, from a car accident and i ran home covered in blood i'm like i was in a car accident i wrecked my car and my mom's like you did not wreck the car we drive down the car she's like you wrecked the car and then the EMT showed up, and then literally I felt my pupils dilate. I turned to them. I go, I'm going down. I knew it was coming, and I just went, whomp. Yeah. But uh, so that was the adrenaline being like, okay, we're done here, right? Yep. No, totally. Wow. Adrenaline's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. I got to get some of that just in case. Um, <laughs> Where can I get some of that adrenaline stuff? Yeah, if you guys have a hookup, we'll talk off mic. Um, Are we so- talking about Limitless now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're switching movies. Uh, we've actually done that on the show. Go listen to that episode. Very fun. So gas, they get knocked out with this gas in the van. And this happens in a lot of movies, actually, where people are kind of knocked out like instantaneously. And I know, you know, from I, I've had like anesthesia before and they have to like put a mask on you, which seems like very, you know, focused gas into your system and so i was just curious if you know what gas this is and if it's realistic that you know within seconds you would just get passed out i don't know what gas it is but i can tell you in the anesthesia machines that we use like sevoflurane and some of the different medications that get their liquids that get aerosolized if you filled a small car with that eventually yes you would pass out the anesthetic goes to the central nervous system and boom you would you'd be out 
Um, and it depends on how much you get as to how long it would last. You said eventually. So we're, we're talking not about seconds, but minutes, perhaps. Yeah, I don't think it would be seconds like that. I don't know of anything that makes you pass out in seconds like that. It, you, need, you need to get a good dose in your system before you'd pass out. Right, because we got like when the Russians stormed that theater, like the Chechen held theater, they threw in some secret sleeping gas, but it ended up being not metered because it's just sleeping gas grenades or they pumped it in or whatever the Russians do to people because they don't care about life. Um, and uh, like what, two thirds of the hostages? Yeah, they killed all the, the hostage takers, but two thirds of the hostages died too because they're like, we will just pump sleeping gas in. Everything will be okay. But you can't just like pump gas into people. No. They stop breathing. Like in surgery, when we do that, right? When they go to put a patient to sleep, you breathe the gas, you get some IV medication that makes you drowsy. You breathe the gas, you fall asleep. And at that point, they have to control your airway with a breathing tube. So they put a breathing tube in you. So these people basically essentially went to sleep and stopped breathing. Yeah. So it's not just about knocking people out, it's about like, uh, keeping an eye on them. It's about making sure yep. that they're okay while they're passed out. And then after they come to, they're stacked in new clothing in 40 foot high bunk beds. Was there like a, was, is there a whole detail of dresser and redressers who are taking their clothing off and putting them? And then is there like people sized forklifts lifting them up and then tucking them in? How the hell are they doing that? That was my really, that was my big, like, I'm That's not one question. of those like, well, I'm falling out of this fantasy world right now, Gandalf. Cause clearly those Eagles can't talk. I'm not that kind of guy, but when, when, when when people wake up fully dressed on a 40-foot bunk bed, I'm that kind of guy. I'm like, nah, can't happen. They can't do that. Logistically impossible unless they got robots. How about the humans in the last couple of episodes, those ladies they had in the stretch suits that were basically like a table for the rich people that were investing in betting? Did you notice that? Well, I've been to a place like that, so uh, that's <laughs> real. That's Austin's real. pretty elite right. now. Yeah, that's uh, when you when you get the Jeopardy money, they invite you to places like that <laughs> to the people table place. <laughs> the people table. <laughs> that's what it's called. It's right next to Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> yeah, they're not secretive about it at all. It's, it's no. very openly the people table place. Uh, no, I did not notice that. That's crazy. Yeah, they had the women. They were on all fours and they were like putting drinks on them and stuff. I was like, what are they doing? Oh, he has his feet on her back. I was like, that's not very nice. Man, yeah, that's wild. And and you're right. I didn't think about that, Austin, about how they all ended up in those huge beds. Like, it would have been yeah. more realistic. I know it would have cut the tension that they're trying to uh, evoke, but I, I do think it would be more realistic if somebody fell. Because you're waking up from a sleeping gas. You don't know where you are. You're way up in this oh, thing. yeah. Somebody's got to fall. For, I would have fell. Like, um, okay, I got to ask about this tug of war game. Because And it's the same with the glass bridge game, actually, where people are dying by falling. And so it just, in my mind, came, you know, what kind of falls can we actually withstand? Like, where's the line between I broke my leg, but I'm going to be okay, and yeah. no chance you survive this, you are dead now? So it depends how you fall. Um, about two stories, I, I want to say about two stories is, the, is one of the higher, highest documents in survival falls. So obviously, Whoa. if you fall two stories onto your head, you're done, right? Like you're, you're oh, totally head. done. So straight on your head, you'll break your neck, you're done. So I could imagine if somehow someone could land and roll, they would just break a bunch of bones and be okay. Hmm. But above hmm. that, it's the impact is just you basically, you could tear your aorta, the big vessel inside that carries blood to your whole body and to the heart. You, you basically tear blood vessels and you bleed out instantaneously or you break your neck and you're dead right away. But no, what? Okay, I understand that. But what? What do we physically, by snapping our spinal cord? What do we do? Do we shut off the brain's capability to operate everything else? Oh yeah, of course, right? Like you breathe because you send signals to your diaphragm. Everything comes from the brain to signal the and body you just to flip do the something. light switch. So once you disconnect those two, there's no signal to do anything. Nothing works, and you're gone. Yeah, the aorta tear. Yeah. So imagine like. Um, Pipes, like piping, plumbing, right? You have plumbing throughout your body. The aorta is, is a big blood vessel that travels throughout the body. It comes off the heart, goes down the middle of the chest into the belly, and it sends blood vessels off to everything in your body. Well, there's tissue attachments to the aorta. There are structures that are attached to the aorta. And if you take a hard enough blow, things tear away from the aorta, and you basically just rip, you're ripping off part of the aorta, and there's a big hole, and you just bleed. 
your entire circulating volume will exit in with a matter of seconds. It's done. Wow. Yeah, That's it's that fast. Rough. Very rough. Fortunately, <laughs> it happens so fast you don't know what happens. Okay, cool. Yep. That makes me feel better. So you'll be all right. <laughs> okay, great. I'm still not going to be free soloing anytime soon. No. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, okay, so I wanted to also ask about dementia. Uh, the uh, number 001, a.k.a. the old guy, O. Oh, Ilnam, yeah. um, who actually runs Squid Game, turns out. Uh, yep. This whole thing's a spoiler, so deal with that. Um, he says at one point that his doctor tells him to count to uh, stave off dementia. So I was wondering, like, is that true? And is there actually anything else that we can do to prevent dementia? I, I, I don't know much about that, about the counting part. But dementia is usually a progressive degeneration and, and within the brain. So it's something that happens slowly over time. And I, I actually have no idea if counting makes that better or not. But the physical acts of having dementia, like Parkinson's dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, or what we call senile dementia when we all get really old we just stop remembering remembering the things that just don't even matter anymore right um but that's just that's that's an aging thing that happens with the neurological connection between your brain and your body the counting thing i have no idea well we've got lots of studies done in old age communities and you know you've got the the classic apocryphal thing you know the guy works his entire life and on the day of his retirement he just shuts down because he just loses it all yeah. Uh, but uh, word, word games and word play and, and puzzles and logic exercises and stuff like that, because when we stop working like, and we just go into retirement mode, we get bored, and then our brain just goes, oh, we're not using that part. But there's lots of studies done. So I bet counting, sure, counting sounds like it would definitely be part of it if you can, you know, if you're counting like – I'm going to count to 150 right now. That's got to be in there the same way as doing a crossword puzzle or doing an actual physical jigsaw puzzle would help your cognitive capabilities. Yeah, counting sounds right. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, I feel like you're right. Any any kind of like mental challenge will will toughen you up for, for your older age. I feel like you're in the prime uh, situation here, Austin. If you're doing trivia constantly, you're probably memorizing thousands of facts. I feel like you're going to be, you know, 504 oh, yeah. when you go oh yeah no no no. i'm memorizing everything i mean that's literally <laughs> because when i'm not training for jeopardy i'm hosting trivia so and writing a trivia book uh and so i'm just constantly writing questions every single moment of downtime with me wow. is right now i've got a spreadsheet open where i'm writing a trivia round for three and a half weeks from now i'm writing it right now so i bank it Man. so is it tough for you like, was it always tough for you to memorize things? Did you have to, like, train up to be better at memorizing? Or do you just, no, you know, you're born I with always, some... I always just memorize. And by the way, not, not mm -hmm. photographic a memory. I just always memorize things. When I was a kid, it was like I had this handbook of dinosaurs. So I'm memorizing all the dinosaurs' names and uh, mm -hmm. and World War, World War II airplanes and all the stuff that generic white suburban kids look at as books as a kid. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but then there's no shortage of high, ha, hopping from the P-51D Mustang to, you know, the capital of Malta. They're still just facts, and they still fall into line like that. Uh, and then, you know, you also get really angry when you miss a fact, and uh, <laughs> then you go back. So, like, that's why uh, I was uh, I was very happy to come here because I'm like, ooh, I want to see if I got my stuff straight on remembering Squid Game because what if that comes up on a trivia contest? And then yes. I'm going to be like, ah, yes, it was tempered glass versus plate glass. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> and are there, like, topics that you gravitate towards or you're like, oh, I'm actually really interested interested in this specific type of whatever car so i'm going to learn all about that or do you just you know are you just happy slash addicted to i'm going to try and memorize a little bit about everything what i'm interested in is not uh actually it doesn't behoove a trivia experience so what i'm interested in like for example hey you nailed it on the head i'm really into cars you know who's not really into cars almost everyone else so no <laughs> one especially since i live in manhattan right i'm like here's a round of trivia on cars they're like the things that get in my way no thank you <laughs> things ruining um, the earth <laughs> yeah exactly the the yellow ones that i get in or the ones that i get on my app is that a car is that a car uh but 
but to be a good trivia host and ultimately good trivia player is uh, not what you like. Mm-hmm. So I do I go out of my way to write around on, you know, current pop starlets like I'll do a Demi Lovato Ariana Grande round, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll 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 do a round on, you know. I don't know, uh, 1950s recipes, because for some reason that's in vogue right now. And these are not things that I am moderately interested in. But then you go down the rabbit hole and it starts piquing your interest in other things. And you're like, Mm -hmm. oh, where did Jell-O come from? Because it's using all these molds in 1950s uh, cookery. And then you find where Jell-O came from. And then, oh, my God, turns out that Jell-O would not have been capable without the invention of gunpowder. And the next thing you know, you're in ancient China. And then uh, you're just down this Wikipedia rabbit hole. But, yeah, what I'm interested in would not interest other people for a trivia round. And actually, it's the hallmark of the worst trivia hosts ever when they're like what 1941 scottish steam train no one cares bro no one cares about a 1941 scottish steam train except you that's great yeah i'm sure you're a delight at other people's trivia nights for sure you're like the harshest judge (laughs) well Um, actually well actually i don't care you lost i i I have been told yeah by like in brain functionality terms that it is good to do things that are not in your comfort zone. You know, like they say, that's one of the reasons learning a language is so great uh, because you don't think your brain doesn't process things that way. And then you can kind of, you know, flip things around and that gives you, I don't know, some sort of uh, youth in your old age, I guess. Memory. So how do you come to know that Jeopardy is going to be your thing? Are you just watching the show and you're like, damn, I'm good at this. Let's go. Uh, spoiler, I don't actually watch the show. I really don't watch <laughs> Jeopardy. I think the last time I watched Jeopardy before I got the call that I was on it was in like 1999. And wow. I didn't go on to like 2017 because I was for 10 of those years. I was a corporate events planner and this is before DVR and this is before VOD. And so like when when on earth in my early to 20s to mid 30s when I was working full time. Who on earth has time to get home at seven o'clock? Absolutely not. (laughs) So then everyone's like, well, I recorded. I'm like, but. You could have recorded it back in the. You couldn't have recorded it back in the day. So there's no recording going on. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're like, but you just don't watch the show. Why? Well, why would you go on it? I'm aware of its existence, and I know I'll be good at it. Okay, it's not like uh, it's <laughs> it's not like you're it's not like you're like. Well, why don't you go to Vladivostok? I'm like, oh wow, that I never occurred to me to go to Vladivostok in Western <laughs> Russia, uh, Eastern <laughs> Russia. Uh, they're like, well, if you don't watch the show, why do you want to get on it? I'm like, because I could probably win some money if I did. And uh, yeah, you were so, right about that. Yeah, Narrow, come on. tell you what, come on, you don't need to know, you don't need to be a super fan about something to like it, and you know, super fandom in general, it turns people off from uh, being right. a casual fan. Mm-hmm. I don't care about the extended universe of Star Wars. Get a life. <laughs> <laughs> just making fun of all nerds on this show oh pretty much yeah 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 that's great um okay so here's another one man they this uh my favorite character i think uh say pak kang say pak i think is her full name uh she's oh, super the girl yeah yeah she is awesome in this and there's a scene and again this is kind of like classic movie trope scene where she has this huge shard of glass in her gut and she pulls it out with just her hand and then just kind of like ties something around. And, and listen, granted, she does die, you know, shortly thereafter, although she is killed by someone with a knife. But it seems like she doesn't have much of a chance. She's like bleeding out. But yeah. I was curious if if you had an issue with this or, or when this happens in movies like because some people yell in the movie to leave it in. Some people are saying, take this out of me. What is the move if we have a shard in us? Do we leave it until we get to a hospital? Do we dump alcohol on it? Do we what what's the move here? <laughs> in real life, you don't pull something out. And the reason for that is in real life, if it's occluding a vessel and you pull it out, you unclot the vessel, the obstruction, because it could be obstructing the bleeding, and then you bleed out and you die. So Whoa. in movie terms, what I would tell you is that 
it depends on what they hit, right? Like if that was a flesh wound and it was just into the muscle and the soft tissues, pulling it out, it's not going to do anything. But if it actually penetrated the abdominal cavity, you could have intestines and stuff coming out. And yeah, you could have a major problem. But the the, the, the dictum in general is never pull something out. Go go to the hospital for that. I have another I trauma think there's some times where you should be pulling. No, there's not. Yeah. <laughs> Is there, I mean, how long, you know, let's say you're, I don't know, you're in a, you're in dire straits. You're in a, you're in an intense situation. It's like, how long would you be okay to leave something in? Cause I assume there's a danger in that as well. No infection. Yeah. It's a foreign body infection. I mean, how long before you would get to what we call septic where infection travels throughout your whole body. Um, sept depends on, it depends on the bacteria, but usually within a couple of days, you would oh. become septic, but a foreign body that's in for for hours is not going to really cause any harm. You have plenty of time to get to the hospital and get antibiotics and all that stuff on board. Wow! But you wouldn't want to go days. Okay, good to know. If you guys are walking around listening to this podcast with a huge shard of something stuck in your gut, <laughs> you can leave it in there for the duration. Uh, you can that scene, to- <laughs> those scenes blow me away, dude. It blows me away. Like when I see those scenes, I'm like, ah, come on. You know, like I'm cursed being a doctor. I'm like, what is she doing? That would never work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would just be so scared to do it for exactly what you described. Like I just assumed some vital organ is just going to pop out of that wound. Yeah. Depends uh, on how deep it is. I had a guy fall at a guy when we were in Chicago who was trying to break into an apartment and he fell <laughs> He fell probably, I don't know, 20 feet onto, in big cities, you'll know, because New York, right? You have the big old metal bars that go around your property from the gates, the metal things. This guy falls, he falls onto that. It goes through through his armpit and it Oof. came out behind his clavicle bone. And Whoa. the Chicago Fire Department had cut the gate off and brought him, brought him in with it under his arm, this huge gate. And that's a perfect example of if you pulled that out and it was an occluding a vessel, then you could kill the guy. The funny thing is we took him to the OR and put him to sleep. This was my last trauma case before general surgery, before graduating. We took him to the OR and put him to sleep. You get x-rays. He didn't puncture his lung, which was crazy. And right behind the collarbone are some pretty big vessels, like really big vessels. And we pull this thing out and we're like waiting. Nothing. He literally, it like skived on his rib cage Whoa. and went up behind his collarbone and like spread the vessels apart away from each other and went right between them. Oh and he God. didn't have one injury. The guy walked out the next day. Oh, it was oh, crazy. Crap. It was wow. crazy. What a lucky crazy. crook. Total that is, lucky That crook. is a survive squid game opportunity right Totally. <laughs> yeah, was it man. Ba- Backdraft. Didn't a Baldwin die in backdraft uh, from that exact injury? Blown Did out. Did he the, die? It, Maybe someone who well, someone know. was impaled on a wrought iron fence in backdraft. I How do you not know this, that. Austin? Well, because it was like <laughs> thirty-seven years ago. No, I'm, I'm, and it's backdraft. It's not like Citizen <laughs> Kane. Oh, Billy Billy Baldwin died. Whoopsie loopsie. <laughs> I'm just I relishing. Was and... Billy, I don't even know if it was Billy Baldwin. That's great. Um, no, that's wild. And and once again, I feel like, I mean, I, I guess it must be often that, you know, a, a criminal or somebody that was in the middle of breaking an entry gets injured and now you have to try and save their life. And it has to oh, come. Yeah. There's got to be some sort of vote where it's like, I don't know. Do we try? Do we even cut this gate up and bring this guy or do we, you know, let him sit yeah. here? You take care of everybody. Look, I'm Jewish, and I had a guy. I've taken care of trauma guys with swastikas. Wow, that's it's not... just it's the job. You, you're not. I'm not the judge and jury, right? Like I get to. I save the life, and that's beautiful. And I move on. I love that. Uh, I, I I can appreciate that for sure. And, I'm a uh, bartender, so I am judge and jury. If I don't like you, you're gone. And they're like, <laughs> I will, I will, I will yelp about this. I'm like, go ahead. Don't care. <laughs> They're like, you just lost a customer. I'm like, yeah, a shitty one. <laughs> if you come into yeah, Austin's bar with a swastika, eye. you are being ejected. Oh, my God. Oh, I just I would I would just love for someone with a MAGA hat to walk in. But, so I could just be like, out? They're like, you're discriminating me against me. I'm like, yes, I am. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> I just Hold like on. the hat. I'm just into the hat. I, just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, like red, the politics. <laughs> red, red really looks good on me. I don't even know. That's great. Okay, um, so Duck Sue, this kind of like you know badass uh, underworld character guy, who's in there, criminal dude, 
kicks oh, yeah. a guy to death in one scene. And, I, you know, not that many kicks, I would say. Maybe like four or five kicks. Like It looks like to the ribs, maybe, to the torso. And then, yeah. or maybe one to the face, because they show this guy, and he's like pretty instantly dead. And yeah. so, Ricky, you look like a pretty buff dude. Do you think you could just kick a guy to death like that? Is that how it works? Um, if you kick enough times in the right places, you can. So you could break a rib, which could then puncture a lung and drop your lung. That can kill you. You could kick someone and, and basically give them a, a subdural or a bleed inside their brain. That can kill someone pretty in, instantaneously, like a pretty bad bleed or a blow to the head. Um, and that, those are probably the two biggest things that would kill someone almost instantaneously. It would be a bad blow to the head or causing a lung puncture. They drop a lung and they can't breathe anymore. I think it'd be really hard to kick someone hard enough to like, you could rupture their spleen, you can rupture their liver, and those guys, those can bleed like crazy. So yeah, you, you can. You definitely can. Okay, pretty cool. Good to know, I guess. Now you know. I mean, you can, like, the hum like humans can inflict a lot of damage on other humans, right? Because like everyone's like, oh, I got in a fight the other day. I'm like, did you though? Because uh, I think you could like be pretty messed up from actually getting in a fight like <laughs> what kind of damage can people do to one another with just like our yeah, given weapons hands. oh man you could poke eyes out you can you can i mean just punching right you can crack jaws break the globe around the eye i mean you can literally from just a punch you could rupture someone's spleen if you if you hit them in the right spot i, I, I would be worried about my foot me makes too. me weak, but I, I wouldn't want to kick someone or try to kick someone to death because I think I'd break my foot. Yeah. That's, That's just me. crazy. Um, okay, so final question. This came to mind for me watching, especially the scenes with Ji-Hoon's mother where she gets diabetes and, and gets uh, gangrene on her foot. They're talking about, worst case scenario, we got to amputate this thing. Um, I was curious if there's things that we can do to help circulation. I know I have a few uh buddies that you know they have circulation like issues and you know uh, uh inflammation stuff austin's raising his hand so i don't know if there's anything any advice there um and then i just wanted to bring up healthcare in general like where do you both of you stand on universal health care is that a, a talk you have with your fellow doctors is you know are, are you guys on that on that uh on that boat yeah so um the blood supply thing is there's not a lot you can do with diabetes. What happens with diabetes, and there's a very similar parallel with nicotine and surgery, like we don't operate on patients who use nicotine um, for elective surgery. So it's a blood supply issue. The tiny little blood vessels at the edge of a cut wound, with diabetes, those little vessels are diseased to the point where they're non-functional and wounds need blood supply to live. So you need good blood supply in a wound to be able to heal a wound. The same thing goes with smoking. When people smoke and use or use any nicotine product, it basically constricts the tiny little blood vessels down at the edge of a wound. So if you go do a big operation, they've got no blood supply to the wound and the wounds just fall apart. So with, with nicotine use, the obvious answer is to stop using nicotine. And unfortunately with diabetes, it's control the diabetes from a very early age to minimize the, the damage and disease to those tiny vessels. But there's no magic machine and there's no magic device that can improve that and yeah should we be paying for health care because what the hell is that about <laughs> uh this is such a tough topic right like there's pros and cons to everything i think a completely socialized medical program would be really not what everyone thinks it's going to be um, but i do think everyone has a right to care i don't know what that looks like um but um but yeah it's uh universal health care it's there's pros and cons and to be honest with you, I don't talk about it a ton. Um, huh. We probably should because I feel like the world is heading that way. But um, but I do think that everyone should be able to be treated in big pharma and how much it costs to get life saving, you know, medications for some people is like ridiculous. You know, like it just shouldn't be that way. Hey, I'm not a I'm I'm not a uh, fan of big pharma, but like you know when you see uh, oh hey what was that oh that's marketing budget marketing <laughs> budget and there's r and i'm like okay well there we go that's the problem and i exactly. think if we took that pie if we took that pie plate and we did what's that big one? Oh, that's the military industrial complex what's that little one eh, 
everything else. So I think they're sort of little microcosms of one another. Maybe if Big Pharma just stopped making stupid commercials where you can't tell, was that an erectile dysfunction commercial? Nope, that's his son. But he's still kayaking like an erectile dysfunctional commercial. So I am not sure right now, and I'm very confused. So maybe they should stop making those commercials. And yeah. uh, and would... and 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 F thirty fives. I don't think can't can't you um in I think in Europe at least in Britain like they the pharmacy they can't you don't there's no commercials for medication. only two nations on earth allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise direct to consumer it is the United States of America and is New Zealand it is banned in every other nation on earth pharmaceutical companies cannot market directly to consumer now of course they do market to people like yourself they do go direct marketing to doctors and the doctors will push it down but I oh that's a great question. How many people come into you? I know you're not properly in the proper discipline, but how many people come into you and they're like, "Well, I just saw an ad for Flermaslaptin. Should I have <laughs> Flermaslaptin?" Because it said, "Ask my doctor about Flermaslaptin." Like, how many people come in? I've always been curious about that. Fortunately for me, being in plastic surgery, I hardly ever see that. So good. You good probably you. more of the more of the primary people get that primary care guys, but I don't I don't get that. I, they come in to me, they go, "Hey, I heard about this plastic device you could put into my breast and make it look bigger. Do you have one of those?" <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. I have a few. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few in the back. <laughs> By the way, I really want some Flerma slapped in right now. I don't know what it does, but yeah. hook me up with that sweet Flerma slapped in. Oh man, I'm telling you, after a podcast like this, you just have that like afterglow, and you need some firm <laughs> slapped in, dude. That's yeah, really it's cool. it's it's Ethan, Ricky, and I in a in a triple bathtub overlooking a sunset, <laughs> just I'm looking firm out. Firm. One of us casually caresses the other's arm. Firm is slapped in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> popping the cap off of firm is slapped in, man. Oh, man, that's a good time. <laughs> Um, I'm surprised, by the way, about New Zealand. That's a weird because for me, New Zealand's always the staple of like, man, they got it going on. Yeah, they I know never what's understood up. that. Never got That's, that. But it is yeah, New Zealand. So it's New weird. Zealand in the U.S. That's it. Only two countries on Earth. So yeah. crazy. Like, right. Do you remember when we were kids? Like, I remember, you know, cigarette commercials and mm-hmm. all the alcohol stuff. Like, you just don't see that stuff anymore. And I don't understand why Big Pharma is allowed to do it. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It should be totally illegal. Um, Especially when we're all so dumb. Like we're all we're all stupid, stupid dummy heads because like yeah. I don't I I am not going to take my advice on anything. I don't take my advice on normal things. I have to ask someone else, should I go outside today? They're like, No, it's cold, don't. Oh my god. So I'm not gonna go to my doctor and say, Should I have this? Yeah. You know, remember back in the day too, like at the end of like these commercials where they would as fast as they could say all of the bad things that you could say so you couldn't catch it. Like, your heart will explode. Your brain is going to burn to death. Like, you, they would say it so fast, and now they actually have to slow down. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a lot of crap. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that one. Mole people? Mole people? <laughs> will, will hearken unto the king of the mole people? <laughs> yeah, and it's arguably much funnier now, like because uh, before there was so many jokes where you know you would just have that really fast disclaimer at the end, but now like the fun music keeps going and they talk as yeah. if they're still describing something <laughs> right. great, but they're saying the horrible things. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really strange. Uh, so anyway, listen, we're running out of time. I I super appreciate both of you taking the time to come on the show and to talk to me about Squid Game and all these terrible injuries people got on the show uh but if there's anything you want to tell people about remind people of uh now would be the time uh dr brown ricky what what yeah. you got you want to tell people love about up, man love up on the world that's all i can tell you i appreciate you guys having me on this was fun i love doing stuff like this but uh yeah just hey world peace and happiness that would be good for me gorgeous okay that's a beautiful thing to say and uh and we'll we got to have you back on to discuss somebody else in some other movie getting their head cut off um <laughs> Austin, what about you? World peace, happiness, and shameless money grab. Uh, <laughs> the ultimate book of pub quiz uh, by the smartest guy in the bar by Austin Rogers. Me is out on yes. February 22nd, 2222, which is a Tuesday. That is a mouthful. <laughs> and uh, after that, I would uh, be going on a 20-city nationwide tour. So look for mm. me in your local towns, and we'll do some book signings, and we'll play some trivia events at each little local town. And You'll buy my book. We'll all go home happy, and I will uh, enrich myself through a shameless cash grab. 
<laughs> I will make sure I don't have a MAGA hat on for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go probably into the nest of the hornets in some places. I'll I'll just have to bl- <laughs> I mean, my name's Austin Rogers. I'll probably blend in just fine. They won't know. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Until you speak up. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Where can people get the book? Uh, Well, if you do order it online, you could pre-order right now. Um, But I would implore you, if you do pre-order, order order it from something like IndieBound or order it from your local bookstore. Please, I'm going to make enough off the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world. But if you're hearing this and you want my book, just go to IndieBound.org and you can look it up there and order it from your own local shop. I'd love for you to keep your money in your community because when I go on tour... I'm going exclusively to local bookshops and local breweries. No big boxes, no nothing like that. They get their money no matter what, so let's help out everyone locally. Nice. I guess I should plug my book, yeah, too. Yeah, come then, on. Right? Why not? Yeah, I want to hear about no, it. Honestly, if you guys want my mind's on Amazon, too, The Real Beauty Bible, it basically the center. my book was centered around just like people who have not been through the process of wanting to have reconstructive or cosmetic surgery, how they approach it. It just walks you through beginning to end all the things you need to be thinking about. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. Audible has it. And then again, if you want one, you can just call our office and we'll we'll mail it out. We can I sign them all and we can send them out. So if you guys know anyone who's looking to have some of that kind of surgery done, the book will kind of walk them through how to choose a surgeon and all that good stuff. So awesome. there you go. Wonderful. Well, get both of these books. Now you guys have your reading set for the next few months. And <laughs> uh, and yeah, thanks again, guys, for for joining me on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Ethan. Thanks for checking out The Good, The Bad, and The Science on Seeker Plus. Is there a movie with some bad science you want us to talk about? Let us know in the comments. Or maybe it's good science. Whatever, we'll do it either way. Also, don't forget to like this video and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes.